In the early 21st century, futurologists announced a new urban peril. Megalopolises are spreading out and becoming denser. Our energy resources are running out, and there's nowhere left to park. Luckily, the technology is there to deal with this growing chaos. Individual mini power plants are managing their own electrons. Algorithms are guiding the footsteps of citizens. And in the control rooms, computers are preparing to replace employees who are too human. Technological urbanism promises hyper-rational cities that are 100% sustainable and perfectly safe. They're known as smart cities. Cities are home to 3 billion people, and another 3 billion are looking to join them over the next 40 years. If city lights resemble a gigantic network of neurons, a challenge of a similar magnitude is opening up. How can we produce the energy required when resources are running out and citizens always have good reasons for turning on the light? What has become clear in the last 10 years or so is that this second industrial revolution is now sunsetting. Fossil fuel energies are getting more and more expensive. We can't get much more productivity out of them. We really reach the maximum uh, potential. In 2003, the massive power cut experienced in New York gave a glimpse of life in a megalopolis after the lights have been switched off. Once the excitement of participating in a super blackout party on a city scale has passed, the anxiety creeps in over having experienced a foretaste of a scenario that is no longer very futuristic, a return to the Stone Age amongst the dizzying tower blocks of an extinct civilization. Fortunately, there are glimmers of hope in these dark scenarios, like Jeremy Rifkin. An economist and designer of futuristic plans for saving humanity, Rifkin has found a solution, revolution, an industrial revolution, and the third revolution to bear that name. What became apparent to me in the 1990s was that we are on the cusp of a new convergence of communication energy, a third industrial revolution. All the great economic revolutions in history occur when new energy regimes emerge. New energy regimes make possible more complex societies. That increased energy flow allows us to bring more people together, differentiate their labor skills, integrate them into larger economic organisms, and expand our economic potential across time and space. Thus, with the invention of the steam engine and the mining of coal to fuel it, the cities of the first industrial revolution sprang up along the railways and the workers' houses were clustered around factories so the people could walk to work. The second industrial revolution emerged with oil and the combustion engine. Populations were then able to spread out thanks to the motor car, and life in the suburbs became a reality, linked by electricity grids and telephone cables. This whole world relies on fossil fuels. Our power, transport, heat, and light, it's all made out of fossil fuels. So in a sense, we have dug up the burial grounds of the Carboniferous Age, and we've transformed all that carbon, coal, oil, and gas, into the accoutrements, the goods, the services, the infrastructure for a great civilization. We built a great short-lived civilization, but almost destroyed the biosphere of this planet with runaway climate change. But according to Rifkin, after coal and gas, the future of civilization will depend on the wind and sun. Internet technology and transforming the electricity grid to an energy internet, a distributed smart grid that actually acts exactly like the internet.
truly is underway. On the other side of the Atlantic, in the north of France, the mining landscape bears witness to a source of energy that is now exhausted. For us, coal meant work. But in addition to that, it meant men who were dying aged 45 to 50 from silicosis. It meant pollution right across the region. We don't deny that history. But that history is over now. It had some very negative impacts, and today, we know that what we have lived here on a local level is the same as what the planet is experiencing on a global scale. In La Sangoelle, after the last pits closed in the 1980s, the ecologist mayor Jean-Francois Caron decided to produce the town's energy from a virtually inexhaustible source, the sun. The huge power station supplies the energy for around 30 homes and even the church, which is converted to green power, transforming celestial light into electrons. Insulating the buildings and building environmentally friendly neighborhoods has reduced the energy bill by 35%. In this impoverished commune, the green argument is also an economic one. Between someone who spends 2,000 euros on electricity and who is cold in their house, and someone who pays less than 200, there's no point giving people a whole spiel about ideology and sustainability. It's just practical. It's better than a pay rise. On the face of it, even in the north of France, taking a gamble on the sun to produce energy has to be worth it because it's free. Especially as the town's various green installations were financed through grants. But Jean-Francois Caron wants to prove that this new energy model isn't just viable for a commune with 7,000 inhabitants, but also on a regional scale. The challenge right now for us is changing the scale. France spends 70 billion euros every year on energy, whether it's gas, oil, coal or uranium. And that goes abroad, to emirs or Russians. Imagine if we could take that money and put it into insulating every building in France. But how can you convince an entire region to throw itself into the third industrial revolution? The spiritual father of energy transition hasn't only come to the Nord Pas de Calais region to visit the church of La Sangoelle. The regional council has called upon him to design a complete overhaul of the region's energy system. And after a year on the case, Jeremy Rifkin is ready to reveal his roadmap. Jeremy Rifkin has a considerable role. In a way, he's like a catalyst. In this region, there are a certain number of forces, a certain number of initiatives. And if we want this to be strong, it needs to be coherent. This is it, a master plan for a third industrial revolution build out in this beautiful region of northern France. Well, Rifkin's plan is to make the Nord Pas de Calais region a world example on a big scale of a new energy model. But is his energy internet a realistic prospect? This was a collaborative effort. Rifkin's dream city already exists. Beautiful like a town planner's brochure is the Wilhelmsburg neighborhood in Hamburg with its famous electric cars. Twelve buildings produce heat and electricity from the sun and are linked by one of the first sharing networks in the world. Our building is linked to the office block opposite through a network of proximity heat and the surplus energy that we have on sunny days is sent back into this local network. For the inhabitants of this neighborhood, it's theoretically possible to resell their surplus energy to their neighbors. If the energy isn't all used, it is sent back into the public network and our meter goes backwards. It really does. I've seen it. Meters that turn backwards are the dream of every consumer. But it's below this neighborhood that one discovers the technological headache of the energy internet. 
Until now, networks have been centralized, with energy produced in the power station flowing out to the customers. The challenge was to predict consumption in order that the quantity of energy sent out was equal to that used. But if consumers start producing part of their own energy and even sending the excess back into the network when they have too much, the production consumption balance becomes even more tricky to manage. That's when digital technology comes into play. It became necessary to establish some kind of intelligence in the network. In concrete terms, we added fiber optics in parallel to the energy network. That network is constantly measuring how much energy is being consumed at every junction. And it also enables us to measure the quantity of heat distributed by each customer in order to balance production with consumption. An IT network runs over the top of the energy network. All the consumption and production data is analyzed by computers, which can thus direct the energy to where it is needed and keep the network balanced. These highly intelligent networks are known as smart grids. There's a huge amount of intelligence behind this system. But the technological problems aren't all solved yet. The problem with green energies is that they aren't always available when one needs them. We tend to want to turn the heating on when the sun isn't shining and to turn on the lights when it's dark. The challenge is to store these intermittent energies. In Hamburg, several cutting-edge solutions are being tested including these drapes, which are not made of green plastic. The green drapes are new. They naturally absorb the heat from the sun and release it when the temperature drops in the room. But for the moment, despite some bold and very expensive attempts to save it, most of the energy that isn't immediately used is still lost and the sun therefore only covers a few percent of the neighborhood's needs. So, what's the situation right now in terms of the shift in energy supply to our towns? On the one hand, some neighborhoods with cutting-edge technology are emerging. As yet, they're not very profitable and are, above all, large-scale tests. Gambles on the future from the big energy companies. And on the other hand, in all our towns, houses and public buildings are gradually becoming covered with solar panels and wind turbines in an attempt to lower energy bills. And all these green producers scattered around are starting to raise questions about the role of the historically huge central power stations. Early on, when I first started introducing this to the European business community, and especially the power and utility companies, let me say the energy companies were not happy with that. And most of them still aren't happy with it. What I said to them is get used to this fact. We have millions of people producing their own green electricity. In 10 years from now, tens of millions of people around the world are going to be producing their own green electricity. So if you're a power and transmission company, we say to you, we'll sell you the electricity, your new mission, manage energy flows for clients. The quest for models goes on, but the percentage of renewable energy being produced is doubling every two years around the world and has just tipped 20 percent in Germany. The situation is such that even the major specialists in centralized energy are arming themselves with digital technology in order to integrate all these new sources of energy into their networks. Every year, ERDF invests over 3 billion euros in modernizing the network. A good part of this goes on smart grids, on the development of smart software, on setting up sensors, and on installing remote controls. And we're going to continue this on the low-tension network with Linky. Linky, the green meter that will soon be moving into every French household, informs the network manager of the precise electrical activity of each household. This is the foundation stone of new energy networks, revolutionary networks where ideally renewable energies will be combined with digital communication. All through history, when we look back at it, 
we see that the great economic turning points are when new communication revolutions emerge, converge, and manage new energy revolutions. Together, they create a new platform, a new infrastructure for a new economic paradigm. And these paradigms not only shift the economic uh, way we organize life, they shift our living patterns, uh, our habitats. They shift our consciousness. They shift the way we organize our relationship to nature. Every building becomes a micro power plant and billions of people literally produce their own power. It's power to the people, literally and figuratively. This region, North Patkele, begins a great journey. This is the region that pioneered the first industrial revolution. But how does the return of power to the people resonate in the Lille Conference Center? Rifkin's plan for the Nord Pas de Calais region promises a slightly more complex power struggle. The cost of the energy mutation is estimated at some 150 billion euros over 30 years, which will come from public grants, personal savings, and private investment, mainly from the digital industries. We already have billions of sensors. We're going to have 100 billion of these sensors pretty quick. Who will profit from this new paradigm? I'd say that we're in a world that is totally unregulated in that respect. And the historic players will be in competition, as we've seen in the telecom sector with new arrivals. For these new arrivals, the energy internet is promising new markets to conquer. Because in France, the Rifkin plan is throwing into question the central role of the country's historic energy producer, EDF. It's a culture shock for sure. He is American. He doesn't understand what public sector power represents. He knows what business is. But at the same time, he's telling us that producer cooperatives will join forces with consumers. He's telling us that we are experiencing the emergence of lateral power. And help the rest of us move on the road you're taking to a new world. Thank you. Will the Nord Pas de Calais region be the emblem for a new lateral power embodied by cooperatives of motivated citizens? Or the spearhead for new energy and digital superstructures? We'll find out in 2050. Meanwhile, in France, the first neighborhood aiming for energy independence is sketching out a possible future. This is the Issy Grid neighborhood in issy les moulineaux the network buildings stand up like the symbol of digital cities. The head offices of Microsoft and Bouygues, the latest candidates for running the energy internet. We think there will be a new player, a neighborhood energy operator, a multi-energy operator. We're talking about water, transportation, everything to do with the environment and new urban services. EC Grid, like the Willemsburg neighborhood in Hamburg, is among those pilot projects being launched by big digital groups to test their technologies. Here, it's not just about energy, but all areas of urban life where data management could prove profitable. These neighborhoods, stuffed with sensors and automated systems, are the store window for self-proclaimed smart cities. Behind this idea for a smart city, there's that spot-on intuition that there's a huge amount of information in and around a city, that is produced by a city, and that there's a lot we could get out of that that we currently aren't getting, and that could really help us better understand it, better organize it, and better live in it. That's absolutely correct.
systems through smart cards here in London, the Oyster card, then the data uh, when people are charged is available to us and that gives us some sense of how people are using the system. So to some extent, the idea of the smart city is to actually take uh, what's being sensed using these various sensors and computers uh, and actually interpret them so that we can actually uh, make the systems better in some way. Michael Batty designs dynamic city mapping for urban institutions. Thanks to Oyster Card data, this animation converts the multitude of individual trips into flows running through the arteries and underlines periods of heavy traffic from minute to minute over a week. The morning rush hour and 5 p.m. peak and the little residual rush at 11 p.m. bear witness to Londoners' cultural and festive outings. Well, we call this the pulse of the city. It's the kind of routine, it's the heartbeat of the city in that sense. Michael Batty's animated maps aren't just pretty to look at. They help the transportation companies to understand the scale of the problems they need to resolve. London's population is growing. The demand for the tube network is increasing. It's roughly 5% year on year, and we have got to make sure that we provide enough capacity on the network in order to be able to handle the number of people that want to use our system. Now, the only way that we can manage that is with computer technology. We've got away from manually driving trains to the computer driving trains, understanding where all the other trains on the line are in relation to it, and making very detailed adjustments to balance that. This automated underground ballet that is controlled by one central computer has allowed the flow rate to increase by 20 to 30 percent without making any infrastructure changes. When adapting the offer to the demand will no longer do, the demand gets adapted to the offer. During rush hour, to avoid total saturation of the trains, the underground increases prices by 50% on average in order to dissuade the least motivated or most poor passengers. And if the ticketing machines are slower than usual, it's because they've been informed of crowding on the platform and are holding back the flow of passengers higher up. The supervisor and the control room are watching the numbers of people. They're making sure they match the number of gates that are open to allow people in, the signs that we have around the station to direct people, because we can reroute people if we want to. If the platforms get a little bit crowded, then we can reroute people and maybe take a little longer to get to those platforms. So there's lots of little ways that we can do this. At the exit to the underground, you might think that each person decides alone where they're going. But here too, smart city planning subtly directs our choices to guide our movements. In London, the Oxford Circus Junction enjoys the densest pedestrian population in the country, and it is impossible to move the walls of these historic monuments. Well, Oxford Circus was pedestrian hell. It was a terrible place to come if you were a pedestrian. Large numbers of pedestrians come to Oxford Circus, 30 to 40,000 an hour, and we have about 19,000 passengers coming in and out of the tube station. Given this somewhat nightmarish situation, the city council and local businesses had an idea to speed up the pace of pedestrians. But how to do that without slowing down the road traffic? For Atkins, a company specializing in urban modeling, the first phase of the operation consisted of creating a digital replica of the junction, complete with virtual citizens, to try out all possible solutions. The first step, really, is to understand all of that movement that needs to happen at the junction um, by means of, of surveying and observing um, how people are passing through the space. We model um, individual types of vehicles because 
the way in which they pass through the junction is different, obviously. But modeling the movement of pedestrians is the most tricky part of the process. How to program 40,000 virtual people so their behavior corresponds to real passers-by in Oxford Circus. James Amos designed the program used to model the junction. After spending hundreds of hours observing pedestrians walking around, he seized upon three parameters that would enable him to recreate every crowd in the world. When a person is um, looking where to step next and planning their route, uh, they consider three things that uh, they've got a destination that they want to go to. Everybody has a preferred speed at which they'd like to walk. And people like to keep a distance around them, so everybody has a, a personal space that they like to keep around them. And so balancing those factors out determines where people step and how they make progress. Then he had to personalize the avatars using these three parameters so that the proportion of tourists, casual workers, and local residents corresponded to those found at Oxford Circus. A tourist may try to keep more space around them and walk more slowly um, than a commuter who just wants to get there as quickly as possible, doesn't mind you know, rubbing up against other people. an opportunity for pedestrians to cross informally. So in, we think it's quite important that if someone sees a gap in the traffic, they want to cross the road, they don't have to use the traffic signal, but they can make use of these perch points. The nice thing about these perch points is when someone's crossing the street, if you don't have them, they're in the centre of the street and they're worried about the traffic. But the pride of Atkins is the diagonal crossing. Every two minutes, the road traffic is stopped completely, and pedestrians can now cross the junction in one go, from corner to corner. We predicted that, on average, people would be able to walk through Oxford Circus around 50 seconds quicker than they did before. And we, we have done some surveys that have basically uh, corroborated that. and a countdown incites people not to waste a single precious second of transit time, because time is money, as those local businesses who finance speeding up the flow know only too well. The scheme paid for itself within six months, so the investment of about four and a half million pounds in this project was paid back for in terms of the retail activity that increased. And I think that looking down from above, you know, a bird's eye view or a god's eye view on these complex adaptive patterns of live dynamic elements that are people moving through the city, I think that's a beautiful thing. I think it's, it's enticing in exactly the same way that watching any natural complex system is. But as a citizen, um, I, I don't believe that flows can be optimized. Cities are not about optimization. They're not about efficiency. They're about friction, and they're about mess and complication, and they're about rubbing up against the different. I think that when you apply the engineering mindset to the terrain that is the contemporary city, 
you run the very real risk of engineering out of that system all of the things that generate meaning and vitality and what we understand as city magic. Is technology killing the magic of the city? Are sensors and algorithms that regulate our movements paving the way for cities designed to run like clockwork? The digital management of our movements underscores a contradiction of city dwellers. The requirement that urban systems function in an optimal way, along with a reluctance to feel as if our every movement or pause is under surveillance. How can we reconcile these two visions? That of an over-observed city where individuals are assimilated into flows that must follow the right paths? and that of a more chaotic and nicer city, where everyone is free to move around freely. When you listen to people who live in a city, very often they'll start by saying, yes, I need to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. They think of themselves as big city, no nonsense, all business types, that I just need to get you know, from here to there as fast as possible and don't trouble me with anything else. But the reality of things is much, much different than that, and much more human. is that you are able to anticipate behavior and to influence it and therefore literally change the future. Change the future. To play this sci-fi script out in terms of Paris transportation systems, Ron Hindi is trying to understand all the parameters that influence the choices a citizen makes as he or she travels. The dream is to get inside the head of a traveler who has to go from point A to point B and who has to select which route to take. I'll get off at Bastille and take the Line 1 to Franklin Roosevelt. That'll be 19 stations, one change, and a seven-minute walk, so I'll be six minutes late. No, no. Gare de l'Est, and then the seven from the opposite platform, and then the one to Palais Royal. If I get the figures from the train tours, that will tell me the number of people who get off and on the train at the different stations. But that won't tell me much about why people change trains, for example. The one at Hotel de Ville via the 11, change at République at rush hour, going against the flow of the smell of roasted croissants, the crowd by the Peruvian musician. But once you cross-reference this geopositioning information along with other data, that's when it starts to get interesting, because then you start to observe all the different characterized flows. So you have to cross-reference a maximum of different data, such as data about the busy periods in the stations, the geography of different places, the weather and concert dates, and find relations of cause and effect. When you analyze that context, then you understand exactly why someone did that trip and therefore anticipate what will happen in the future. That's how, using data from the SNCF, combined with a multitude of other databases, the Transilian app can predict busy periods for suburban trains, from station to station and from coach to coach. The app's advertised aim is to help travelers find a seat. 
We are capable of making predictions up to one week ahead with a degree of precision of 80 to 85 percent. And by giving that information to users, we are helping change people's habits and therefore helping ease busy periods, which are one of the main problems facing public transportation operators. By managing constraints and offering alternatives, the world's capital cities are trying to rid themselves of individual cars that take up room, pollute, and are anything but smart. In London, the congestion charge by which drivers are automatically billed eight pounds when they enter central London, while in Paris, the number of parking spaces is being drastically reduced. And in both cases, a new service is being offered that combines individualism and shared interests Vehicle sharing. Bicycles are the new indicator of sharing in cities. In Paris, one third of the city cyclists is on a Vélib, and on average, each Vélib is ridden by five different people each day. After witnessing the success of the Parisian scheme, 500 cities around the world have now introduced self service bike sharing schemes. Contemporary bike sharing services are a primary example of networked information services in the everyday streetscape. GPS, RFID, it's all there in that object. It's much less obvious than somebody coming along and saying, we're going to run the smart city from this underground, centralized information operations center. It's much more quotidian. Um, but in the end, I think it makes a much greater difference in people. see the eclipse of capitalism, it's going to play a role, but it's going to play a more streamlined, smaller niche role in a near zero marginal cost world. Increasingly, the collaborative commons is going to become the economic paradigm because it's best suited to maximize the opportunities of an Internet of Things world. The current reality of our big cities is to an extent reflecting Jeremy Rifkin's predictions. But in London and Paris, poorer populations are still relegated far from the historical centers, which are full of connected and environmentally friendly infrastructures, but aren't really accessible by all. The risk is that this accessibility doesn't cover everyone. And here I can very clearly see the risk of a new kind of hierarchization of urban spaces. And that means there will be some people who will be better connected than others. Paola Vigano is an alternative planner who is providing consultation services for the project for the creation of a large Parisian metropolis, Le Grand Paris. She believes the concept of smart cities will accentuate the divide between hyper-connected centers and their peripheries, peripheries where a more spread out and diffuse kind of urban life is developing. When they say that more than half of the world's population lives in cities, it's not that they live in cities in the traditional sense. More than half of the world's population lives in diffuse urban conditions. That's urban life. So we have to come up with projects and strategies for those types of cities. 
The project Paolo Vigano is pushing for Le Grand Paris throws into question the convergence of all the networks towards the historical center. It promotes, beyond the center, less official places, places which themselves have been appropriated by different populations. We call these significant places. They are places alongside waterways, areas where sports are played, ethnic markets and all that. And perhaps the first strategy is simply to promote these places and to reinforce the connections and possibilities for exchange between these points. As such, Le Grand Paris might be conceived beyond the center of Paris like a territory that is rich in terms of significant places for these different Driven by local leaders, experiments for digital villages are springing up, like the one launched in the district of Luchazu. The aim of smart communities is totally centered on the well-being of the population. The technology isn't an end in itself, and we're not looking to make it a showcase for the neighborhood. What we want above all is for the inhabitants to feel and recognize that their quality of life is improved. In this neighborhood of one million inhabitants, the main preoccupation for those in charge of the community is security, and a thousand cameras are helping them. The population feels safer, and if they experience any delinquent acts, they can come and look at the video recordings that we keep here. In this dispensary, the population is invited to drop in every six months to have their blood pressure checked. All the data comes directly to our platform, and we are now able to build up a database that allows us to analyze the evolution of blood pressure in the neighborhood. Centralizing data about local health means they can measure the impact of public health programs and offer personalized treatment. If a local resident's blood pressure is giving abnormal readings, the patient is then put into contact with his or her doctor directly from their home. This system avoids the emergency room becoming overcrowded. The inhabitants of Luchazu can also take courses or do their grocery shopping via their TV. And everything is registered on the chip in their ID card, which they also use as a house key for buying their groceries like any credit card, and even to clock in for work as volunteers. As such, when volunteers clock in at the Shanghai Underground before going to their official job, the hours they spend there are counted. Health, purchases, hobbies, voluntary work, comings and goings, everything is recorded on the inhabitants' digital ID card. But where does all this data go, and what is it used for? The smart card information is collected here, in FK Network's computers. So 
We class people according to certain parameters. For example, people in Group A are over 65 and live alone. If a person in Group A hasn't left their house for two days, the software picks that up. An alert is raised and sent directly to the neighborhood association that can go visit them and check everything is okay. Mr. Dong's control center also watches over other categories of inhabitants, such as former drug dealers or addicts. If we notice that a person from this group is showing more activity than normal, the neighborhood association will also go to check if everything is okay. Maybe they'll notice that they've started taking or selling drugs again. We only report abnormal situations to the association so that it can then do more in-depth analysis. For now, FK Network manages the data from 60,000 inhabitants of Shanghai, but it is hoping to spread its services to cover several million. In order for a system to work in China, it has to satisfy three requirements. Firstly, the population has to appreciate it. That's the most important thing. Secondly, it has to satisfy the government. Thirdly, it has to be profitable because we are investing a huge amount of money in this project. This costly data management program is partially financed by the neighborhood community itself. Soon more funds will come through the personalized advertising that Mr. Dong is hoping to put up on entrance doors, and lastly, by the government, which can also use the data collected and the 20 categories of citizen that have been drawn up from it. In Shanghai, they are flaunting the goal of citizen well-being, thanks to central control. A city being watched by watchers who are themselves watched by a supervisor. This is one of the recipes for a smart community. In London, video surveillance rooms, which easily bear comparison to those in Shanghai, are obliged to make all recorded information publicly available. This offered an opportunity for the Get Out Clause to make a free music video by posing for the city's cameras. William Gibson famously says, the street finds its own uses for technology, and this is never truer than with networked information technology. We see different people making different adaptive reuses of things. They push back against the frameworks they're offered. They misinterpret them, they use them against the intention of the designers, which is one of the most interesting things. Is the rebellion grumbling about the colossal accumulation of personal data by urban systems? In concrete terms, travel around the city, the precise energy consumption of households and communication between individuals is recorded by every public company, with the aim of making each system function in an optimal way. But for those who own and know how to read this data, more questionable uses are emerging, from personalized marketing to surveillance systems. Collecting data about individuals is both an absolutely amazing opportunity and, of course, an absolutely amazing danger, too. Could this data, that is so useful to businesses or public bodies, also be useful to me in the same way? in terms of understanding, in terms of decision-making ability, in terms of my capacity for action. If yes, then we are slightly changing the order of things. We are in a situation in which we have actually shared out power. On the one hand, the idea that the planning of the city must remain the exclusive territory of an elite, and others must settle for simply using it, building in it, or maintaining it. And on the other, the hope that a city reflects the will of all those who live in it, a more shared power. 
I would say that the historical trajectory is on the side of distributed, but there's big questions about control, ownership, open or proprietary and closed. And it's a generational shift. Will there be a struggle over it? Absolutely. That means that this new movement, the collaboratist movement, not the capitalist movement, has to begin to flex its muscle to ensure that this whole new opportunity isn't enclosed for the interest of a few. The data recorded by urban sensors is like a digital fingerprint of our lives. When compared and analyzed, we gain a better understanding of the very complex system that a city represents. But will this information be the new tool for a central power? A kind of big brother who can control urban life down to the smallest details? Or does it foretell the arrival of a greater collective conscience, a city where all the inhabitants, each heading for their own destination, will understand how their lives are connected to a greater humanity? The prospect of a big brother will always be a threatening prospect, but it's a prospect nonetheless. And it is through disorder that we can fight that order. And it has come at the right time. The digital world is an extraordinary driver for disorder. That prospect is complicated, it's tiring, but it's funny at the same time. And I think technology affects neighborhoods differently than it does cities considered as abstractions. Technology filters into neighborhoods at different rates. People make different uses of it. You know, at the end of the day, what I'm interested in is, is the neighborhood, is the scale of the neighborhood, and the affinities and the allegiances that grow out of immersion in the life of a defined patch of the Earth's surface for an extended period of time.